But let me just say, there is nothing like being in the presence of God. YouTube can't do it. Facebook can't do it. As beautiful and as powerful as the messages are that come, there's just something about the gathering of God's people. And when we come together and the anointing that is just released over the church and over His people, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm going to jump straight into the Word because I'm so excited for what God has put on my heart. You're going to have to watch me this morning. You'll notice I'm not using my earpiece this morning. I'm using a microphone. Uh, we've picked up some sound difficulties with, with that earpiece. But here's the problem. If you put a microphone in a pastor's hand, then he wants to go all evangelist on you. He, he go, whoop! <laughs> so I just want you to just give me, cut me a bit of slack this morning. I'm already excited to be in the house of the Lord. I'm already excited because of just being together. But when I open the living word of God, then I just know He is getting ready to speak. And let me just tell you, when he gets ready to speak, we need to settle ourselves down and just say, okay, Lord, I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to hear what the Lord has to say. So every outside voice, every outside disturbance or distraction, we switch that off right now in the name of Jesus, for we just want to hear our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Amen. So for those of you that weren't here, I, I, I've been building uh, in a series called Born Again, and I've been encouraging our people to get back to the basics. I believe very often before God takes you forward, He says, listen, let's get back to the foundations. Because sometimes we can run so far ahead of God that we forget the foundation upon which things have been built. And God is getting ready to build some amazing things into us. But before He does that, He says, I want you to remember a few things. And, and thus the series, we've been speaking about being born again. And what does it mean to be born again? Well, there was a man who was supposed to be a teacher of the Jews, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a great scholar of his day. And he came to Jesus and tried to impress Jesus with some of his theological knowledge. But, but Jesus just, he just put that all aside and, and Jesus sat down and started speaking to him about being born again. And I believe that God is speaking to his church again, again about being born again. Yes, blessing is good. Amen. I, I, I love the fact of being blessed. But so many people have got the wrong idea of what it means to be born again. So many people have got the wrong idea and because they don't know what it means to be born again, they don't know what it is to walk in the blessing of God. God. Somewhere along the line, it just seems that in order to be blessed of God, you have to be wealthy. Everything's got to be open and shut. Everything's got to flow. And if you don't have the wealth coming, brother, then you're not blessed. Do you know the mindset where, where the last mindset where we saw that manifest clearly in Scripture was through the Pharisees? Nicodemus and his people. They believed that if anybody was going through some sort of a hardship or a tough time in life, they obviously couldn't be blessed. Oh no, God has taken his hand of blessing off of him. They believed that if you wanted to mark the blessing on somebody, you would see it by the length of their flowing robes and how rich they were and, and how much influence. And, and boy, aren't we hearing that same message preached from so many pulpits today as well. I want to declare I don't have one flowing robe in my wardrobe but I am blessed of Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't drive the latest Bugatti I don't, or Hennessy Venom. I don't drive those things, but I want to declare I am blessed of God. Just yesterday, I took my son and we went to go spend some man time together. You know, have a bit of man chat. And, and, and we went out in the property over here and we sat overlooking. We were just chatting a little bit and talking and and the next thing, out the corner of my eye, I noticed in front of me a mulberry bush. And, 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 and I said to Riggs, hey Riggs, check a mulberry bush. Now the t last time I picked mulberries from a bush, I must have been not much older than Regan. And the amount of time that me and my son spent under that mulberry bush was amazing. But then he started out eating me. I, I just couldn't keep up anymore. They were so delicious. So I went and I sat up on a hill and I just watched my little boy having this amazing time. And do you know, do you know that for a few minutes his whole world was all about the mulberry bush? He was blessed. And, and I said to the Lord, as I was just sitting there, genuinely, I, I got so overwhelmed inside of me. I really got overwhelmed. I said, thank you, God, for that mulberry bush. You put that mulberry bush there and you have created a moment and a memory that me and my child will remember for all our days. When he's an old man with kids of his own, I'll say, do you remember the time you spent with your dad under a mulberry bush? Why? Because we're blessed. 
We're blessed. God knows how to give good gifts. For a moment there, his whole world consisted of the mulberry bush. Can I tell you how you know you're blessed? Not by what you have or what you don't have. That's when Jesus is your mulberry bush. Everything, your sights, your whole world revolves around Jesus. Doesn't matter what comes, doesn't matter what goes, doesn't matter what opens, doesn't matter what closes. You are not like the shifty seas of the uh, waves of the sea because Jesus is your focus. That is a blessed state of mind, brothers and sisters. We're going to spend a bit more time speaking about that as time unfolds. But I'm going to pick up this morning as we start looking at some of the evidences of what it means to be born again. So we're picking up some pace. We're going a little bit deeper now with Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. We're going to go a bit deep. Say deep. We're going to go a bit deeper this morning. So let's go together. We started off in verse 1. This morning I'm preaching the text, uh, John 3, verses 7 to 12. But I'm just going to read verse 6 just to go in there, you see. Uh, so, or from verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Did you notice Jesus gave us evidence here? If you want to know if somebody is born of the Spirit, it's not by so many marks that we're hearing about today. This is the evidence. Let me read it to you one more time again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, amen and amen, Jesus said. I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? This morning, we're getting ready to look at a bit of evidence. This morning, we're getting ready to examine a bit of evidence. Jesus said, if you want to know if somebody is born of the Spirit, these are the things that you need to look at. Don't look at all the peripheral, peripheral things. I will show you how to know if somebody is born of my Spirit. Let me just remind you quickly. Last week, when we spoke, remember I told you of a Greek word that's got a double meaning. Right, so for 10 out of 10, who can stand up and tell me that Greek word? I'm just joking, man. Relax. The Greek word was anothen. Remember that word, anothen. And that Greek word could either mean to be born again or to be born from above. And so remember, we said it wasn't either or. It was actually both. You had to be born again. But when you were born again, you couldn't be born of the fleshly source. Now you had to be born of your father and born of above. But I want to show you something else here this morning, because if you could listen to this, 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 this exchange between Jesus and Nicodemus in the original language, you'll notice that there was another double meaning word that was injected into it. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. This is what I'm saying. That word for wind and for spirit is the same word. That, that, that original Greek word, pneuma. So you could either read it, the wind blows where it wishes, da 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 da. So it is everyone born of the wind. So it is everyone born of the wind. So what was Jesus uh, speaking about? Was he speaking about the wind or was it he speaking about the spirit? Once again, I say it's not either or, it's both. Jesus is speaking of both and he's using the analogy of the wind because he's showing us that what represents the Holy Spirit best to us is the wind of God. It's the wind of God. Say wind of God with me this morning. The wind of God. And no then a double meaning word, pneuma, a double meaning word as well. And then what Jesus says, what he's been teaching is he says, in order to see the kingdom of God. Oh, it's my desire to see the kingdom of God. Listen, 
It's not my desire to see the kingdom of God just when I die and go to heaven, right? That's for most Christians out there. I don't want to be an ordinary Christian. I, I, I want to stand with the psalmist David who says, I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord while I am yet in the land of the living. Amen. So I, I want to see thy kingdom come. Jesus didn't teach us to pray thy kingdom come just willy-nilly, just so he could fill in a bit of space in the prayer over there, just so we could sound good. He taught us to pray thy kingdom come because he wanted to put upon our hearts an expectation for his kingdom to come. Thy kingdom come come so now listen what he says he says unless you've been born again so in order to be born again let's join some dots now in order to be born again jesus says uh, uh, or, or to see the kingdom you need to be born again you need to be born from above you need to be born of water right and you need to be born of the wind slash spirit as well so i just want you to bear those things in mind as we go a little bit deeper this morning there are some marks of people that have been born again. Did you notice that Jesus said, the wind blows where it wants to blow. The wind blows where it wants to blow. The wind blows where it wants to blow. If you want to know something about the Holy Spirit, you cannot contain the Holy Spirit. I, there have been so many teachings about, well, if you want the Spirit to move, you need to do this. And you believe in this way. And you believe in that. You can't put a formula on the Holy Spirit. The, it's almost as if our theology today is we need the Holy Spirit to follow us. So if we do this, He's going to do that. If we step this way, He's going to... No! What Jesus says is you need to keep in step with the Spirit. If you want to see a manifestation of the Spirit, don't expect the Spirit to be following you around. You need to learn to get sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and learn to keep in step with Him. You follow the Spirit around because the Spirit is going to blow wherever He wants. And this is it. This is it. What we need to do is develop a sensitivity that when you hear the wind blow over there, you get there. Oh, and when you hear the one, you drop everything you need to drop and you get there. Because you can't wait to see, to feel the gentle breeze, the life-giving breeze of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit moves. Why did Jesus speak of the Spirit as being a wind? Was it just because the wind represents or shows? I think it's so much deeper than that. It's not just that the wind represents the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, no, no. No, not just that the wind personifies. No, there's more than it. There's more than that. Have you considered the work of the wind in our world today? The great work of the wind. I mean, I mean, when you stand and there's a gentle breeze, it is nourishing and it is beautiful. Uh, but when you stand and the wind rages, it is fearful and, and it is powerful. And, and you may not be able to see it all, oh, but boy, the effects of that wind. One thing I can tell you about a wind is as it increases in power, as the wind increases in momentum, the wind moves something. The wind is a mover. The wind is a shaker. The wind gets things going. Those pile of leaves may have lied dormant the whole season. But when season changes, the wind picks up. Some of us have been lying dormant because we haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to blow upon us. And we say, Lord, when, when, when? And God says, your sails are down. Put your sails up, man. Let your sails catch the wind. You're going to get some movement coming through in you this Oh, the wind is an agent of great good. You think of, you think of the farming, you think of pollination. There, there, there would be no life on earth if there was no wind blowing. The trees are pollinated. Uh, it moves things. When, when, when the wind blows and there's lifeless limbs and logs hanging in, in the trees, the wind blows and snaps off all the dead branches, fall to the ground so that new life can grow on that tree. The essence of wind is new life. But listen to me very careful, carefully. The same wind, if it increases in momentum, can be a force of great destruction as well. People are telling me now scientists are trying to get to, you know, the Sahara Desert. And one of the reasons why they say the Sahara is so big and keeps increasing is because of the prevailing wind. Now, I would have thought it's because of the hot sun. I would have thought for lack of rainfall. But they say because of the prevailing wind, it has dried up such a huge part. 
millions of square kilometers, the Sahara Desert, prevailing wind. Yet in other parts of the world, that same wind brings life-giving clouds, bringing life-giving nourishment, life-giving waters. We read in the Bible of God using the wind. I read in the book of Genesis that when Noah was on the ark, and, and the world was flooded. It says God sent a wind that blew. And, and when the wind started blew, blowing, all the waters of the world started, of, uh, started receding and the ark came to rest. I, I, I read in the Bible when God was getting ready to liberate his people from Egypt. He sent an east wind and the east wind brought many locusts. And brought the plague of locusts. Then when, when God wanted to get rid of the plague of locusts, God brought a west wind to come and blow all the locusts away. I, I read that when God and his people were standing trapped on the edge of the Red Sea with their enemy pursuing them, God sent an east wind to come and blow upon the Red Sea and a blue and, and a channel opened up for his people. Get this, the same east wind that brought the locusts upon his enemies was the same east wind that opened a way where there seemed no way. We read of the wind and the function of the wind, how the wind came and, 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 and lashed against Jonah's boat. And because of that, Jonah was thrown into the sea and we know the rest of the story. The wind that came and lashed Paul's boat in the New Testament. When we just look for it, we can see the movement of the wind and how very important the wind is. And, and only today are people starting to speak about wind power. We've known about wind power for the last thousands, couple of years, man, in the Bible. We've, we've seen the wind of God moving over the earth. The wind brings life. The wind dispenses life. The wind dries up life. It is both a force for life and a force for great destruction. Mm. Do you want to go somewhere with me quickly? Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 14 when it speaks about angels it says are not angels ministering spirits let me give you the original Greek are not angels ministering winds <sighs> so so when so 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 when Jo uh, the, Moses and the Israelites were standing on the bank of the river. People may have seen it as just a wind blowing, but I want to tell you there was a ministering spirit that was sent to open the Red Sea. Ministering winds. Ministering spirits. I, I want to tell you something about angels. Those of you Pentecostals who have fallen into the trap of worshipping angels. These ministering spirits, they don't serve you. doesn't say they, they've come to serve. They have come because God has sent them by His will. According to His will, these people that are Christians that are getting into a new age and summoning angels and commanding and sending your angels. Let me tell you something. The Bible says in the Old Testament that when King David came against the wrath of God and, and when King David numbered the fighting people and incurred the wrath of God, when King David insulted God, God sent an angel against the Israelites. One angel of God wiped out 70,000 Israelites. That angel isn't your servant. He serves the living King of kings and the Lord of lords. When, 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 when Joshua stood in front of the commander of the army he said are you for us or for our enemies the commander looks at him and says neither for you or for your enemies but i come as a commander of god's army don't you be worshiping angels you worship your father is who is in heaven you worship your lord and savior jesus christ don't be praying to your angels you, you we've got no allegiance to angels you pray to the king of kings and to the lord of lords in the name of jesus christ and then you see the wind start moving on your behalf the wind blows where it will the wind is vital to life listen as we go a little deeper, the, the, the wind in the Bible where it speaks, it says it bloweth where it will. 
I love the King James sometimes as well. The wind bloweth. Now the Greek word for bloweth is the Greek verb. From the word pneuma, we get the word nay. It bloweth. It, it, it's, so, so listen what it means. It means to blow hard. It's not just... <laughs> it blows. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying the wind blows hard where it will. The wind blows. And, and, and nobody can contain it. Now, if you want to get out of the wind, you can go and stand inside a house somewhere. And if the wind's not a tornado, it won't take your roof off. You can avoid it. But there's little you can do to stop the wind blowing outside, right? Because when it blows, when it blows hard, it blows. Let me speak to you for a moment about the life-giving nature, not the destructive force. The life-giving nature of the wind. The word that spe speaks and is translated blow, it speaks to blow hard. It can either mean, get this, get this, because this is where we're going now. It can either mean to blow or it can mean to breathe. The wind ble breathes, it, it can blow, it breathes wherever it will. Is it, is it, is it, is it any, any mystery why we're told that the scriptures of God, that God breathed the scriptures why because they're not just the word they just not, not no, they're living words he breathed life into the words he breathed all scripture is god breathed when we pick up his word we're not looking just to philosophies and opinions of men we we want to feel the breath of god coming out of these pages and infusing our lives Go a little bit deeper. Let's speak a little bit more about this breath now. Let's speak a little bit more. Because the first time in the Bible that I see breathing and breath associated with life is in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 where it says God took man and formed man out of the ground. And when God, you see, when he had formed man, he was just a statue. He was a sculpture made out of clay beautiful one in the image of God but he was just a sculpture Adam himself was an image of God in clay a statue uh, uh, but it's when God breathed hard into him Adam live and he lived life giving breath upon him now here's the thing that we need to understand a little bit later in the Bible, the Bible actually speaks of that as being the breath of life. And it wasn't just Adam that had the breath of life in him. Because the Bible says all living creatures that dwell upon had the breath of life in them. In other words, when it spoke about Noah taking all the animals, God said all those with the breath of life. You'll take so many of the clean and so many. So every living creature that is above the earth, even those in the sea that need gills to soften air, every living creature has the breath of life in them to some way or another. So th this is my point. God prophesied through there. You see, all flesh has got the breath of life, but Jesus himself said, the flesh availeth nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. What Jesus was busy showing us is that through the creation of man originally, that was prophecy for a time that would come that God would once again breathe life. But this time, the source of life, the born again life, wouldn't be flesh life. It would be from above. It would be life breathed into your, into your lungs and into your heart that wouldn't just quicken your mortal body, but that would quicken your immortal body. That which was dead would now be life. That which was immortal will now live forever. That which was dead will live forever. Oh, God was getting ready to breathe upon his people again. All, all flesh is born with the breath of life. But not all flesh is born again. And I believe that this is what Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus about when he was speaking about the wind bloweth. The wind bloweth. You see, Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and knew those scriptures so well, all of a sudden some pennies start dropping for Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Jesus was, 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 was precise in his language. He was, he was, he was strategic in his conversation. 
with Nicodemus. You see, if you're to be born again, it's not going to be because you've studied the scriptures and can quote from Genesis to Revelation. Mm. It's not because you have a faultless church attendance, although, God help me, I wish more of us would. It's, 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 it's not because you pay your tithes or... It's because God has blown hard upon you. He's blown hard within you. And when he did that, that which was inanimate, life, life, resurrection life, started working within you. You, you see how, how this was fulfilled? There was a prophecy that came in the book of Joel, and it was repeated again in the book of Acts, where it says, the, t- the day will come, and in the last days, he says, that I will pour out my spirit, I will breathe my spirit upon all flesh. The day will come. Say, and you know how we saw this fulfilled in the book of Acts? You see, sometimes we don't, we don't join the dots here, but, but that's what we're doing here. We're joining some dots. This is how it was fulfilled because the book of Acts records a time when they were all gathered together in one place. Here's the thing. You see, if each one was in his own home saying, oh, well, I don't see why it's important that we gather in a church, they would have missed it. The point is, they were all gathered together in one place with an expectation on their heart. That's, that's, that's the point of why the Bible is telling us the importance of gathering. And as you see the day coming, do not neglect the gathering. It says, I say, oh, well, coronavirus. No! They were all together in one place and we're told, and suddenly, you see the violent language of the, wood, the, of the wind, and suddenly they came from heaven. It was born from above. It came from above. A sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the house. That's how the Holy Spirit came. Why? Because the Spirit is the wind of God. That's why it manifested as wind. This is the Spirit of God getting ready to blow, getting ready to move upon His people. Oh, I'm ready for the Spirit to blow. Oh, I'm ready for the Spirit to blow. And it's not my place to say, oh, come on, we're going to have a crusade for people to be infilled by the Spirit. It's not my place to say, come, let the Spirit get poured out. It's not my place to do it, but it's my place to say, where are you blowing, Lord? Let me see. Where are you blowing? I'm going to get there. Oh, Lord, doesn't matter if it takes me to the other side of the world. I'm going to get to where the Holy Spirit is blowing. I am following after the wind. There are some people that are called storm chasers. You know, that's their job. They chase the storms. <laughs> That's what they're paid to do, to go take photographs and take instruments and take readings. There'd be no storm without a wind. Come on, let's be, in this last day, let's be storm chasing Christians. Let's see where the Spirit of God is busy moving. And then Jesus said to him, he says, you do not know. He showed showed Nicodemus, he said, "The, the wind moves wherever it is. And then he shows Nicodemus again, not to be mean or cruel, but he shows Nicodemus ignorance. He says, the, the wind moves. At a later stage, he says, Nicodemus, you're supposed to be a teacher, but you don't know this stuff. But, but before that, he says, you do not know where it's come from or where it's going. You see, even unbelievers can see the wind moving. I'm here to testify to you today that there are even unbelievers that are seeing the Spirit of God moving in this world today. Some people have been mockers and still are mockers and scoffers. But deep down by there, they said, well, I heard once when I was small going to Sunday school about these things happening in the world, right? They might mock it. They might knock it. I want to tell you something. There's evidence of the Holy Spirit moving in the world today. I remember when I was still very young, uh, when I say in the Lord, very young in the Lord at Bible college, you know, and I went to this charismatic Bible college and, and uh, you know, I, I just, there were some things happening in the church that I just wasn't too happy about. And I, Lord, is this of you? Is this, of an, is this not of you? How do I discern, Lord, what is of you or what isn't of you? And, and, and you know, I went for a walk in a valley in, in Port Elizabeth called the Barkin Valley. And on the top was a foot trail and at the bottom was the, bi- the bicycle trail in the valley. 
And the top foot trail took me to a place where there was a bit of a cliff, a bit of a mountain cliff. And, and I sat with my legs hanging over. At the bottom was a beautiful river. And in the river, growing in the bottom were these beautiful bulrush type reeds. I was saying, Lord, please show me. Show me how to discern what is of you and what is of your spirit and what isn't of your spirit. And just then, a wind picked up. It had been dead quiet up until then. I, I believe that there was a ministering spirit there that was sent of God to come and show me something because this wind came at that moment and started blowing across the bulrushes. Now, I couldn't see the wind, but I tell you, I could see the effects of it because there was a definite pattern in that, there was a definite pattern in that uh, bunch of bulrushes. I could see the pattern. I could see the pattern. And all those that were given over to the wind would flow as the wind. But right in the middle was a dead old tree standing. You know, as they get all gray and without bark and dead. And as the wind blew, the dead tree stood. And the Lord put on my heart, he said, Warren, that's how you recognize my spirit. I'll not have one dead tree standing up in the middle claiming any glory for himself. You'll see it manifest amongst all my people. And you'll see a pattern moving amongst. I'm not talking about democracy here. I'm talking about being moved upon by the Holy Spirit. You will see a pattern of my Holy. You will learn to discern. You see, when people started uh, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God was breathed out upon those believers in the upper room. They started just speaking in tongues. And there were a bunch of people around them that, that, that could see the evidence of it, but they didn't understand what it was all about. You see, they didn't understand where the wind came from or where it was going, right? And, and, and so the manifestation of the Spirit, the effects of the Spirit are manifest to the people. But this is what God is saying to his church in this last day. I don't want you just to be limited to the effects. I want you to understand where it's come from and where it's going. I want you to understand my motives. I want you to understand my heart. The, you, you remember last week I spoke about signs for believers and signs for unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. One of the signs for believers is the spirit of prophecy. Is prophecy is prophecy just about knowing the future no that's a bunch of flaky people that get into that stuff there's very little difference between them and madame medusa sitting with her crystal ball i'll tell you what prophecy is prophecy is knowing the heart of god prophecy is about knowing the motives of god when everybody else has seen the effects of the wind you know why the wind is there and you understand what's going to come after the wind has blown because you understand the heart of god that's the spirit of prophecy. I believe God's getting ready to clean his church out, getting rid of all these flakes running around. And God is saying, I'm going to breathe in the true spirit of prophecy. People that know my heart. They're not running around after all this peripheral nonsense, but people that know when I blow, why I blow. The reason, they, 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 they know what has come, but in, even more important, they know what is to come. Because they know me. Because why? Because they've had the breath of life blowing upon them. The spirit of life born upon them. Church. Oh, church, let me tell you, let me tell you. This is why Jesus said, when you see these things happen, lift your head for your redemption draws near. I am so excited to be living in these times. I won't let the coronavirus dampen my excitement for Jesus. I won't let e economies crumbling down and wars raging. No, no. All these things were written about. We know. Now is the time for the church to stand up. And oh, for God's sake, more so for your eternal sake, don't you dare stand up in your flesh. No, no, no. The time for fleshly flaky christianity is over jesus spoke about those who had an outward form of godliness but deny its true power now is the time for the true sons and daughters for those who have truly been born of god to stand up the bible says all of creation is waiting for the revelation for the sons of god to be revealed i pray to god that when that time comes, I pray to God that this church will stand up with their heads held high. Not looking in pride, but looking for where the wind is blowing. Knowing where God is moving. Why? Because we're a church of sons and of daughters. Born again. 
born again. It is God's will that we know and that we understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, let me read this verbatim for you as we're getting ready to close. For who knows a person's thoughts except, listen to it, the spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God. Listen, listen, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. I shared with you my heart as a Pentecostal preacher, pastor, I think on the very first time that I preached this series and I and I shared with you about the need to stop the nonsense that's going on in the name of the Spirit of God. It's a mockery. And, I, and as I stand in this last day, I believe in the signs. I believe in preaching uh, under the power of the Spirit. I believe in tongues. I believe in driving out demons. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that they're for the church today. Not that they were limited to the church 2,000 years ago. But I don't believe we should try to return to the church of Acts. I don't believe that. You see, in the book of Acts, the church was just born. It was a baby. Jesus is not coming back for a baby. He's coming back for a bride. And I believe we need to grow up in our exercising of these gifts. We need to grow up in making God's will known to the world around us. Because those of us that have the Spirit of God breathed in us can see. But we are to be ministers to people that can't see. Why? Because we know the mind of God. He has given us. He has not just given us his spirit so that we can flow in the gifts. He has given us his spirit so that we can know his heart. And prophesy his will into this word. I'm excited for next week. I'm excited for where God's taking us next week. We're still picking up. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you and I want to speak a blessing upon you. As we get more and more prepared. For the spirit of the living God. Bow your heads with me church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father we love you. Oh Lord. Like we've never said it before. Let your wind blow. Let your wind blow. Oh God. For, for your wind is a life giver. Your wind does not bring destruction to those. Who are covered under the shadow of your wings. Oh no. But Lord as we say. Those who are born of the Spirit, those who accept your truths have accepted and claimed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior who is crucified for our sins, dead and buried and risen on the third day. Lord, we stand here as your church and say, let your wind blow upon this church. Oh, let your wind blow upon the people of this church. Let your wind blow within us, deep within our nostrils and into our inner being, that we can keep being filled by the Holy Spirit. Just like we keep needing to breathe in for our bodies to survive, we need to keep having that infilling for our spiritual man to survive. Oh God, we are so dependent, literally, for every breath that we take, we are dependent upon you. I want to pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, as we're getting ready to go our separate ways. Father, would you give them an encounter this week? I want to pray that you give them an encounter that inspires, that uplifts, uh, that shakes them, Lord God, that moves them where you want them to be. Oh, Lord God, we are so excited to be led by your Spirit. Keep us in step with your spirit and sensitive to your moving that we may know where it's come from and where it's going. For I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. As we go our separate ways, Lord, I speak your blessing upon each and every person here. I know many have got challenges of daily lives, but those challenges are designed by the enemy to keep our eyes closed to the bigger picture. I want to pray for breakthrough and blessing upon my brothers and sisters like never before so that they can keep their eyes squarely upon you.